Wes Chatham and Ty Frank. Hey, what's up, guys? Hey, how are you? Uh, well, guys, thanks for coming to the show today. Really appreciate you being here to talk about The Expanse. Uh, really excited for the last two episodes of season six, but also just shocked that we're there already, that the show is kind of coming to a close on Amazon, at least. Right now, I want to talk to you guys about uh, what your feelings are at the end of the show, now that you've gone six whole seasons. For me, mm. yeah, it really hasn't really hit me yet. It hasn't, uh, you know, this has been a, a routine that we've been doing for almost seven years now. We go yeah. to work, we go to Toronto, we uh, do six months, then we come back home and then we start doing ramping up for the the show's release and start doing press and talking about stuff like that. So it just feels like it's part of the routine. It hasn't really hit me that uh, I mean, I guess I shaved. So I guess I guess <laughs> that was that was me saying goodbye to Amos. Ty has wept in my arms a couple of times. So I think it's already have Tim. But uh... <laughs> no, I just do that for the fun of it. <laughs> you just do that just, just to get close. just to, just to be cuddled by those those manly arms. <laughs> now, I, I mean, for for us on the writing side, uh, this was a weird year anyway, because this mm -hmm. was the covid year. So um, normally Narain Shankar, the showrunner, and I would be on set um, out in Toronto for the entire production from the first day of prep through the last day of post. And uh, this year, all the producing was remote. Mm. So in a way, it's already like we got a year's practice at not doing it because, you know, we ran the writer's room remotely. We ran producing remotely. And so, you know, we we didn't have like a an onset um rap party at the end of the year like we always do so like we sort of we sort of slowly moved into this being over with rather than it just all hitting all at once yeah so i think i got used to the idea was that really strange doing remote producing the interaction that i really missed was the interaction with the directors um, we had to do all that remotely and we still did it you know i'm we still noreen and i still worked with all the directors um in, through all the prep stuff but it's just different when you're on you know a phone or on, you know, you know, video chatting than it is sitting in the same room with them. You know, can't, you can't just jump up and grab a marker and start drawing on the, the whiteboard, uh, the thing that you're talking about or the shot that you want or the sequence you're trying to develop. Uh, so it did, that made that part of it more complicated mm -hmm. for sure. You guys have your podcast tying that guy. Your producer, Joe, is actually in the chat too, uh, which is great. I, I was happy to see that both of you guys were coming here. And I just wanted to ask you both about how you made such a strong connection together. Well, you know, you talk about COVID and uh, and how it affected our shooting. Mm -hmm. One of the things that if that it, how it affected me the most is I missed the good time that we all had. Uh, everybody involved with these fans, we just have a good time. It's fun. We hang out on set. We have a good time. And Ty in particular, him and I love the same things. We're, you know, we, we love the same uh, all things genre, movies and TV and stuff like that. So we would usually all get together uh, with the writers and Rain and Dan and uh, the other actors. And we would always have dinners and we just sit and talk, you know, about certain things that we love. So the podcast was kind of the answer to us being locked down. And we were thinking, you know, let's 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 do something where we can still connect and we can talk about the show, but we can also talk about all the things that we love to talk about. And we can invite, you know, people that like the expanse. We can invite them into the conversation and create a community with everybody to hang out and celebrate all things genre. The short answer to why Wes and I connected is tequila. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and beards, but mm -hmm. I lost mine. So that's right. So it's uh, gone. What I think. Whatever yeah. love you had, it's over. Yeah. It's over. <laughs> what are some of your guys' favorite movies, and what are some movies that really drew you to want to be in the genre that you're currently in? I, I mean, I could start because The Expanse is is a love letter to a number of different genre things, but one of those things is the movie Alien. Um, that when I saw the movie Alien when I was a kid, um it just completely changed my brain. The idea that, that, pe you know, people in space didn't have to be starship captains or, or admirals or, you know, fleet commanders. They could just be blue collar workers that yeah. guys in jumpsuits with name patches and like tool belts on could be working in space. And that was such a fascinating idea to me. My love of that movie is all over the expanse for sure. Yeah. And I feel this. I mean, that's one of the things that I recognized when I first heard about the book, started reading the books, but also when the script, when I first read the script, I, I felt alien in that. And alien was such a, 
a, a, such a profound movie in my in my life. And uh, and I loved it so much. And uh, and also around that time, like Blade Runner and uh, the, the sequel to Aliens. And so I always uh, within this with w- w- within my career, I always wanted to be a part of something that affected me the way I was affected by these things when I was a kid. And and uh, I just feel so thankful that the expanse is one of those things. Yeah. And Wes, yeah. you mentioned kind of when you got your hands on the script, you found a lot of alien in it. Uh, when you did kind of get your hands on the script and even start auditioning, what was your familiarity with The Expanse uh, as a book series at that point? I was at a Comic-Con for uh, the Mockingjay movies, and it was I think it was a year before. And there were I don't know if I don't know if Ty and Daniel had a booth or something, but there was something there with the The Expanse book series. And I remember it just kind of. And then I had a friend tell me about it. You know, hey, have you read The Expanse yet? Well, I'm always, we're always reading. We're always genre. We're always talking about certain things. So I got a hold of the book and I started reading it. And it was, it's one of those serendipitous, like, uh, ma- moments that, just, it, that you it's hard to believe if you, if I tell it to you, but basically you start reading the book and you start getting involved. I was like, wow, I really enjoyed this. It's very good. And it's really interesting. And then I come home one day and this is back when they would send you scripts and there was a script on my doorstep and it was the expanse. And wow. I was like, wait a minute, is this that thing? And then I and, and Amos was the, the character that I was most drawn to um, in the books. And that was something. And I, and I saw that. And once I realized the same thing, my first thought was, are they going to let me read for Amos? My team wanted me to read for Holden and uh, they wanted And I was like, no, Amos, <laughs> trust me, Amos is the character. I mean. I, I'm not doing me wrong. I mean, like, I, but I just felt like I just had a strong connection to Amos and I felt like that was the thing that I needed. That is a, the part of that I needed to tell the story. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And how did that also change or uh, kind of even go deeper into your love for Amos as a character? Because I know you, you must have read The Churn as well. Um, what role did that play in kind of wrapping your head around the character? For me, The Churn was the most important important step for me is when uh when i found out about the churn i read the churn for the first time that is the foundation that we started creating the character off of and really kind of going back Mm. and seeing what happened to him and how that would play out uh and how that did play out within the books and kind of and and it everything the way hamas behaves the way it it is all rooted in meaning it all it all it, it doesn't come from nowhere it all started somewhere and it all it's all a, a reaction to things that he went through in, in a childhood and so since it's rooted in that truth in such an honest place uh it's a, a I, th- I think it's one of the most it is the most fascinating character i've ever had the opportunity to play and it's going to be it's going to be sad uh not playing him anymore the turn was you know we stopped pussyfooting around about amos's backstory we'd hinted at it in the books in a number of places hinted at the kind of tragic upbringing that he had. And then we just had this moment where like, you know, let's, let's, let's stop, you know, hiding this football. Let's just show everybody what it is. And that's when we decided to do the churn. And I'm glad we did because, uh, you know, Wes later, um, he's mentioned this a number of times and he was just talking about like, that was the thing that helped him dial in the character even more than the books did. Um, and didn't Wes, didn't you give that story to like a psychologist or a child psychologist or something to what? talk about the, the trauma? Yeah, I did. I gave it to her and she and we had a long discussion. I was like, if somebody went through these things, wh- wh- how would that manifest? What would that look like? Mm. And so then we did this. Uh, we did a ton of work and kind of going through with that type of trauma and disassociation disorder and all of those things. And uh and so then what I thought was really interesting is then having that work done and kind of and then bringing it into the performance is seeing people pick up that are going through similar or had similar childhoods or going through similar things. And and it really connected them. They were saying they saw, you know, themselves and their mental health represented in this uh, through this character. And so it was uh, it was uh, it was great. And it was it was, you know, a lot of people like to do the easy diagnosis of of oh, Amos is just a sociopath. And <laughs> for, for Daniel and I, it was much, much more complicated than that. And we wanted to show 
why it was complicated, why it was much more complicated than he's just a sociopath. Yeah, I, I think that's one of the most compelling parts about the Amos characters, because I, I feel like he could easily have filled out this role of or archetype of like this tough guy kind of character, but it's really not. There's a lot of layers behind that toughness, and it's really like more not to display like courage or anything. It's more to just take care of what needs to be done. Well, you know, what's interesting is that there were there were some struggles early on. There would be directors that saw Amos as what you just said. And so they would try to make him into the, the, the macho, tough guy, Uber. And, and we would have to say, like, no, this is, not, this is not who Amos is. He doesn't have an ego in that way. He's just, he's a survivor. And, you know, and he's going to take the easiest route to survival. And I ended up giving the churn to a lot of directors in the early days to kind of really get their head around where it was. Even on the writing side early on in the first season when we were writing it, trying to explain to writers that Amos doesn't threaten people. He makes statements of fact. If he says, if you do that, I'm going to kill you. That's not a threat. He's not trying to like, you know, out macho you. He's he is stating a fact that don't do that or you'll end up dead. And, you know, that's it's it's very flat. It's there's no macho in it. There's no like, you know, because when people threaten, it's because they're scared and they're trying to keep something from happening that they're scared of. But Amos never does that. He never he never tries to avoid the thing. He's just saying if if X happens, Y will be the result. That's just a fact, you know, connected to the show. It was really tricky to get them to finally understand the pathology that Amos has and why he does the things he does. A good example is that there was one scene, uh, I think it might've been season one or season two where Alice gets in a bar fight and Amos shows up and they're in a fight. And then he, and uh, the way that it was kind of staged initially and the way they're talking is like this John Wayne standoff where Amos spins around. It's like, Hey, this is my friend and all this. And I was, and, <laughs> and I was like, this is not what's going to happen. What's going to happen He's going to pick up a bottle because the guy's already attacking out. This guy's already a threat. And he's going to pick up a bottle. He's going to smash it in the back of his head and then and handle it that way because it's the quickest, most efficient. Why would he turn around and draw attention to himself and take the threat on when he could just eliminate it? He's already has the, the surprise attack. He already has the advantage in this situation. Why would he give that away? <laughs> that whole John Wayne shit, that's about ego and yeah, posturing yeah. and all that. That's not Amos. That's like the James Bond villain telling, I'm going to drop you into a pit of sharks in 35 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. right. Ty, as the kind of writer of the character, were there any moments where Wes came to you with a point about the character that you were like, huh, I never really thought about that before? If you're a writer, people think that your goal is to have as many words as you've written, get on screen. And that's not actually the case. Your goal as a writer is to tell the best version of the story. And sometimes the best version of the story is less words. So the actors I like working with, and I think a lot of writers like working with, are actors who come to you, they don't come and ask for more lines, they come and ask for less lines. And, and the thing that Wes would do quite often is he'd come to me and he'd go, I don't need to say this, I can, just, I can just act that. I don't need to say that line, you'll see it on my face. The writers actually started writing much more condensed dialogue for Wes, just because we all knew that was going to be, be how we approached it. And so you just try to find the minimum number of words for Amos to say uh, for every scene. Yeah, the reality is I, I, I don't read well. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, Ty, you made a great point, too, about the adaptation process, which I kind of want to dig into a little bit. You know, nine books total, but of course, six books associated with the TV show so far. How did you go about I incorporating all the narratives of those books into the show? Of course, uh, things have to be left out. Uh, some things had to be uh, accentuated even more in the show. Um, what was the process of kind of narrowing the books down? We have a showrunner, Narain Shankar. Ultimately, Narain made those decisions, uh, what got included and what didn't get included. Now, Narain is a collaborator. He's a person who really likes working with people and collaborating. So we, as the writing team, all got to be involved in those decision-making processes. But when a push comes to shove, the final decision on what's going to stay in the show and what isn't going to stay in the show is, is Narain's decision. Mm -hmm. Um, and one of the things that Narain and I did the first couple seasons uh, is at the end of each season, he and I, because we'd be in Toronto together, we'd stay in Toronto for a week after the after shooting was done mm -hmm. and just sit in the office and plot out the next season. When the show got picked up and the writer's room started up again, that became our template. Mm -hmm. And we'd come back and then develop the rest of it with the rest of the writing room. Whenever they would sit down, the first thing they wrote out always was fire West Chatham. <laughs> 
Yeah. <laughs> but I would always talk my way back in. You just see like the vote result next to it. It's 51 to 49 every time. <laughs> <laughs> that just hurts even more that you just barely made it over the thing. How do you feel about creative satisfaction uh, at the end of season three versus at the end of season six? This is the conversation that Noreen and Daniel and I had had uh, the whole time we were on sci-fi. Cause you know, when you're on network television, uh, nothing is ever secure. Every, every next season pickup happens at the 11th hour. You know, there, there's like a, a cutoff date for when they can pick up the next season. They always wait until like midnight on that day. We would always have conversations about, so if they didn't, if they don't pick up the next season after this one, what can we do to sort of end it? And the conversation that where that ended up was there's a sort of natural stopping point after season three, we can kind of have like, in a way, it kind of tells a complete story because it's here's humanity trapped in one solar system and it ends with humanity now having access to many solar systems. And that kind of is an end mm -hmm. in a way. But it, like, you know, Wes was saying, it's a little it's a little unsatisfying. So we had the same conversations when we got to Amazon, you know, because Amazon would be like, where how, how, how far do you need to go to feel like you can deliver an ending? And season six was that spot because the very first episode of the show on sci-fi it started with a text crawl and that test crawl presented a problem of three competing factions mm -hmm. in a solar system that was under high tension and it it would turn into war all it took was a spark right right the the end of season six pays off that text crawl and so for me that feels like we made you a promise at the beginning of episode one we're paying off that promise at the end of season six. That's pretty satisfying. Now, can we do more stuff? Yeah, there's another trilogy of books that that sort of picks up the one loose thread from season six and tells the rest of that story. But I'm okay with a show that only has one loose thread. You know, I, that's much better than a show with like 50 loose threads. So I'm, I'm pretty satisfied with what we've done in season six. By the way, Ty and I both disagree about text crawls. And yeah. I think text crawls get a bad... I, I'm a fan of Ted Scrawls. Like once I hear in a world or like, it's like it was, it was 2042 and I'm, I'm all in, I'm all separate story, but Ty thinks it's, it's lazy. It's lazy. R write, write, write the script in such a way that we already know that backstory from the script. Don't tell me at the beginning. It, I, what, what would Terminator be without the text crawl in the beginning to set everything up? I think it would be a better movie. <laughs> wow. I'm not bashing that movie or James Cameron. But just picture that movie where the arrival of Kyle Reese and the Terminator is a surprise because you haven't seen that text crawl. Imagine how much more interesting that movie is, how much more intriguing that movie is. Text crawl is studio fear. Every text crawl is because somebody at the studio went, I don't think people will understand. Can we put a text crawl at the beginning that explains everything? <laughs> it's always fear-based. Every text crawl is fear-based. You don't need a text crawl to explain the story to me, but I'm also not as strong as Wes is. So. <laughs> Wes, if you had a, uh, a text crawl for a movie about your life, what would the text crawl say? Uh, this is going to be a sad, boring waste of your time. <laughs> <laughs> tune in elsewhere. by the way i really want to see a movie with that text crawl because the balls the balls on that text crawl are amazing Where it's, yeah. the text crawl is like this movie is a sad boring waste of your time <laughs> that, that is amazing I, yeah. please somebody make a movie i think with we've that actually the reached a medium crawl. on this because I, I would actually love to watch that movie if it started that <laughs> right? way. i i if if you have the balls to put that in your text crawl at the beginning i am watching every fucking minute of that movie <laughs> What would your text scroll be, Ty? I know what yeah. it would be. The the speech in Conan. The speech when, the, when he, the, Oh yeah, the, the riddle, riddle of steel. Of steel. Yeah. Oh yeah, fuck yeah. yeah. That would be Ty's text crawl. <laughs> no, my text crawl would just be text crawls are lame. Fuck off. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> John um, would just be mega death, right? Mega, Coming over the thing. mega yeah. death. And then a sweet <laughs> guitar lick just opens yeah, up the just, whole yeah. Movie. Yeah. Yeah. just opening with tornado of souls. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do, 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 do. Last few things on the expanse. Are there any plans immediately to get picked back up for to finish off the last three books? What Noreen and, and I and Daniel have always said is there are three more books. Um, you know, we, the three of us are going to continue to work together on other projects. So if somebody comes along and says, hey, we'd really love to make those last three books, you know, 
we're available. Let us know. But uh, no, we're not. And and we're definitely not pushing the fans to do like a big, you know, fly airplanes over Amazon headquarters kind of thing. <laughs> um, Amazon has been very good to us. There is no need to bully them. Please don't bully Amazon. They uh, we're really happy they gave us the three seasons that they gave us. So. Uh, and this we, was we a, have we have no need to push Amazon to do anything. Yeah, I've read that the books were actually uh, conceived as the idea for an MMORPG kind of style yeah. game. Um, I'm wondering, are there any ideas? I know you got a game coming out for the series actually pretty soon. Um, but are there any ideas to go back to that model and get a full RPG made? Because I think the series would be really great as a game. I, I, I haven't heard any uh, talk about an MMO, but um, I know... So Alcon has a digital division, mm -hmm. our studio, Alcon. Uh, so Alcon Digital has... They're the ones who put together the Telltale project. I know they've talked about some other projects that they're developing that I'm not allowed to talk about yet because they haven't been announced. But uh, Alcon Digital is definitely in the works with some other things. Um, that at some point they'll announce. Ty, Wes, um, it's been an absolute pleasure having you guys on the show. And uh, I just want to thank you so much for being such a delightful conversation. And I'm wishing you both the best of luck, uh, Ty, with like the novella that's coming out soon. Uh, and Wes with whatever you got on the docket. Well, I, I'm I'm a writer of the books, so yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah, you got Wes. Right. Yeah. Wes is the actual sorry. writer of the books. Um, All I, the truth has came uh, out. Sorry, yeah. I mixed you up. I meant Wes. Good luck with the novellas coming. Thank up. you. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Thank my, you. My yeah. bad. My I'm bad. tired of Ty getting all the credit for my hard work. <laughs> um, I'll just go back to my my day job of uh, male modeling. Thanks for having us, John. This yeah. was a good time.